Lionel, how are you doing today? I'm well. How are you? I'm really good. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank um, you. I binge watched the three episodes. I'm calling them episodes. They are movies, ah, but yes, they're episodes. They <laughs> uh, back to back. So first of all, congratulations on those because some of the stuff in there is literally some of the best action I've seen in a long, long time. Wow. Thank you. Thank uh, you. But when you got the offer for this, because huh. for me, building one in the world of John Wick must be like being offered akin to like Mission Impossible where you're like, oh, okay, all hands on deck. What was your initial yeah. reaction to that offer? Well, my initial reaction was um, Chad, who was my mentor, because I'm part of the 87 Love and Action Design team. I was not involved with any of the Wicks, you know, so um, I would call my brand, my creativity, what I contribute to action. Uh, I haven't had a chance to express myself in that world from working on other films. But when I got the call and uh, he said, hey, do you want to do the Continental? Of course. I was like, hell yeah. But at the end at the end of it, when I hung up, I was like, oh, hell yeah. You know, because, you know, there's the pressure, there's the expectation. But then also there's a level of excitement of saying, hey, I can't wait to get into the script. I can't wait to see who these characters are, what styles they have, and then go off and do my research on uh, what can I bring that'll be fresh and unique to this in the 70s. So, you know, cool challenge, but, you know, a fun challenge as well. And what would you say is maybe the most fresh or unique uh, addition, I guess, you brought to the world of John Wick through the show? Oh, that's tough. Um, <laughs> look, it all starts with teamwork. It's not just myself, of course. Um, I have a great U.S. stunt coordinator, great... Um, Budapest stunt grenade along with great fight choreographers as well. Uh, we all work together. Um, I would say my specific job is I feel like I'm a good storyteller in the sense of I try to recognize patterns such as in a fight scene. If you tell me I have one minute for a fight scene, I'm not looking at how many kicks and punches I can combine in that one minute. I'm looking at what levels, what dynamics, what shifts we have in it, what tones we're expressing, different camera movements. I'm trying to find a way for you to make it feel fresh. Because if you're not a martial artist, you have no clue what the inside crescent kick was, the low sweep, the roundhouse, the leg check, the inside inner movements. That doesn't mean nothing to most people, but it's how it's presented and how it's told. Do you feel tension, drama, the pain? The way you invested in the story of the actors, I feel like you have to have that in fight scenes as well, or it's gonna be forgotten about real quickly. As much as it did, it was very clear like the 70s, late 70s influence in in the storytelling and in the action sequences, but one of the, the like, especially in the third episode, I'm finding it very difficult to like specifically not I, I say get anything. It. I get it. Uh, but specifically in the third episode, uh, the biggest influence I felt was the raid, which if you're going to uh, 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 uh. be influenced by any movie, you may as well be influenced uh. by one of the best action movies. Uh, would you say it's fair to say that there is, you know, that influence okay. of the raid in there? Here's here. It's funny you say that. I come from the independent film circuit. Um, if anybody checks my credits, I come from the low budget world. Uh, because I feel like that's a great place to sharpen the tools, express yourself on short schedules where the action truly is important because they don't have a big budget. So you usually have a, a playground. Uh, I did a film uh, called Undisputed 3 uh, with Scott Atkins, who actually played Killer in uh, John Wick 4 under the fat suit. Yep. Yeah, so he stole the show. Amazing guy, loving to death. Okay. That led me to meeting uh, a team of uh, producers from XYZ Films. And a lot of people don't know this because it didn't happen. I was actually contacted to do the Raid remake in America. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's how I met Gareth Evans. That's how I went to Indonesia. And uh, yeah, we worked side by side on talking about the American remake. Uh, while I was there, they were prepping the Raid 2. So I saw their process, got to work with Eco and the guys. So they felt like I had that same flavor to carry what they established in Indonesia to America. So when you say that influence, you know, that's that's a compliment because, you know, those guys, I admire them so much of how creative they are with what they did with a small, small budget that was so impactful. And I say to myself, why can't we do that? Why don't we take that time to express our stories now? Key thing they had, they had martial artists who became good actors. 
and tell stories as to where we do the reverse engineering process. We take actors and try to make a martial artist. So that's why the fight scenes were so believable because you had masters of Salat doing that style. So my job as an action director is, okay, got it. He or she's not a martial artist, but how can I get that visceral, gritty, uh, dirty, grounded feel that you think they've been doing martial arts all their life? And at 8711, we have a formula and we do our best to execute that formula with each actor, thus John Wick why John Wick fight scenes are believable, and I wanted to carry that same feeling over into the Continental. Very quick sidebar, has there been any update on that Raid remake? I don't know where it stands right now. I, I, I don't know if the rights went back to uh, XYZ right now, but yeah, that's gonna be a challenge. Whoever takes on that challenge, uh, from the director to the action team, you know, because it, it still holds up well, you know, for what they've done in that amount of time with that budget. You know, do I think an, a remake is needed? No, I don't think it's needed, but will it probably happen? Sure. Will they throw a big budget at it? Sure. Will they throw the who's who of names that you've seen everywhere in it? I'm sure that's going to happen. But if you get the right director, the right action team, I think you still can make something special and make it our version of what they've done and respect it as well and hopefully still make something fresh. And then four across the the three episodes, again, of The Continental, one of the things that stood out for me was that no two action sequences really felt the same, be it with the camera work, be it with the stunt performers in it or the action sequences in it or the way things were edited. Uh, and that always helps, you know, differentiate, you know, mm -hmm. instead of just going, which which episode was that fighting again? Like, it, it, that never yes. happened to me because yes. I was yes. able to point them out immediately. Uh, From your perspective, mm -hmm. was there one singular stunt or a singular set piece or singular sequence that proved to be more difficult or more complicated than I guess you might have thought uh, beforehand before mm -hmm. you took it on? Without spoiling anything, I want to say episode three in a mm -hmm. very small space. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That was, that was, <laughs> yes, a very small space. That was challenging, but that was also fun. I mean, um, Albert had a vision. He he said, "Hey, just think a raging bull." You know, um, even though there is a contrast of what raging bull was compared to what we. He said, "Filming style. Think a raging bull. You don't have to be linear. You don't have to have the connective tissue the whole time. You know, so the edit can jump. You can pop around. You can just get the the grittiness of the fight." And if you were on the left, you could be on the right, you know, you can, you know, ramp in, do different things. So he gave us, you know, a formula and then we did a few versions of it and settled on the version you saw. Uh, but yeah, that was challenging because of the space and uh, trying to say, man, how are we going to take the audience inside here that they're going to be able to see and feel what's happening in this? So that was, that was such a cool challenge and I'm happy you enjoyed that one because uh, when the world sees that one... I think they're going to talk about it because it can be easily forgotten about because there's so many other action sequences that are going to happen after that one. So we did our best to put a lot of love into that particular fight so it's not forgotten about. And one quick final question, uh, considering the centuries of history that could be told within the world of John Wick, and then there's even the, the distance between the end of this show to Keanu's movies. Mm -hmm. Is there any period in time you'd like to see maybe the next season of the show be set in? Not sure where they're going to take it, but because we were the 70s. Now, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if we locked in. Were we mid-70s? Were we late 70s? I think it's still up for interpretation. I would like to see us in the 80s, you know, because for one, you get the evolution of the style. You get the evolution of different cars, uh, weapons. Um, the martial arts changes just a bit, just a bit. We, could, we, we can uh, make it a little more contemporary at that point, but also with Albert's music, his needle drops, you know, which is a driving force in this as well. The 80s are iconic, you know, for music as well. So I would be curious to see what uh, himself and Kirk would do with developing um, a season two or possibly the 80s, you know, so that could be fun. Fantastic. Larnell, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. This is my house. Kill all these suckers! What I'm asking you to do is not easy. I'm offering you a chance to decide who you want to be.